interface to teach, we prioritize design and project based learning. Methodology, methodology is a power student to have a real world challenge. By immersive students and hands on projects and guiding them through the environment process, we foster problem solving skills and practical application. This approach prepares students to excel in the dynamic fields of technology. Our aim is to equip students with skills in the underlying often innovation, critical thinking, and the challenges of the 21st century. With the degree of education, more than the other course, students will utilize logic and supported decision making to a positive change in the business. Collaboration of education skills will be an interactive project facilitated by technology resources that transcend and collaborate. As educators and role models, we have both a constant set of values. Ultimately, the vision of education and education revolves around recognizing the unique intellectual and emotional capacities of your students. By providing hands on learning experiences to reduce the opportunity for deaths, fostering a culture of individual collaboration, and actively involving the students in our we empower them to realize the full potential of the future of the same community. And with that said, I just want to highlight uh, a multitude of our successes in the past year and running the spread. So, there will be a quiz um, In the past year, over 2023 2024, we hosted an engineering primary program for high students, 67 students, and four cohorts. Running prototype utilizing CAD pre trained electronics. The engineering fundamentals course for students, 24 A students, and doing 10 years CAD pre trained electronics for the course that we're doing today. The Make and Able High School program, 40 creating the Make and Able Crop and assisting technology for agency and those in the culture. Summer STEAM program, 120 students in an eight week program covering various STEAM topics, including coding, VR kits, skateboard program, and drone pilot. Girls in the game, 19 girls in the program, uh, coding in Python, and developing their own player in there. We hosted four strides at Yale, 600 students from across the globe with three visits in industrial design and engineering activities. The level up with Project Longevity, 10 individuals in a four week program, groups of frustrated individuals providing CAD training and software. Standing the Art and Rise program for high school students. 30 students fabricated the future field with recognizing their status as scholars. Trinity College Design Thinking Course, 35 students engaged in a lecture and fabrication session led by Nathan Steele CTTI. After teaching, our proposed design educators participated in two set hour workshops, building their own free printer and learning how to utilize that in an educational setting to optimize their students' learning. We hosted the Maker Battle event last year. 63 robots and 246 attended this public robot combat battle. These programs and events highlight the Makerspace CTs commitment to provide hands on learning experiences, engineering, hand design for students in the building, and no cost, thanks to our relationships with general filmmakers who believe in the potential music we will have. The number of individuals that you can count that we were able to impact last year's educational programs was 1,250. Woo. Looking ahead, we're hosting the Make Without Combat Robot Series April, July, and October. We're hosting a positive egg class in the spring of 2024, starting in May. The town is team, we're hoping to enroll right now, we can go to 100 slots. Uh, last October, Grace Academy, uh, girls teaching combat robots to them to the girls. The enable is running an intersection in the fall to make the treatment from their hands. We have a funny relationship with the Craft Academy Design and Engineering, providing middle school students with exposure to industrial design. And we have a partnership with the Queen's Lake, for happy to announce the Christmas Center. So thank you very much for being here. We can't do that. You can do that.
small and large, representing a diverse range of industries from every part of the state. Chris, previously, was division president of Leggett and Platt Aerospace, a unit of S&P Spike Company, that had leading operations at the company's middle company, pitched manufacturing facility, and locations in Washington, Canada, and France. He joined Pegasus, then currently on in 2002 as general counsel, who was named president in 2006 as a member of the um, Defense Department. Uh, implemented a series of strategic initiatives as president of the company, doubling employment and revenue numbers before being acquired by LMP in 2016. Prior to joining ISIS, Chris eight years as an attorney representing corporations and individuals on a broad range of issues, including labor and human contracts, workers' comp workers, and acquisitions. A former chair of security and board of directors. Okay, not that. This is going to chat with us now. Here is incredible. 
and you know, we have real opportunity in Connecticut to not only grow our economy, grow our economy, but we have a great deal of more opportunities for our residents. Hector and I uh, are involved in Valley State in a amazing study. We have 119,000 small families who disconnected to every town in every city in Connecticut. 10,000 new in um, 70 years of small families in Connecticut. And we need places like Nick and Kate, Fred and CT, our piece of supply, and many others to either prevent those folks from becoming off track and just uh, this is ideally what we want to do. But if for some reason they have to become off track in Connecticut, they can surely have a pathway. Our youth have a pathway. Women, immigrants, formerly incarcerated, our veterans, they can sure everyone has this pathway and opportunity so they can realize their dreams. Great economic mobility, which will turn continue to grow our economy and create this great cycle of growth and opportunity. Growth and opportunity. So, you're going to hear from the uh, panel, and I'm sure they'll talk about where they play in this space. I'll leave you with this thought. We're sitting here in one area, in one small part of Connecticut, and we need to create safety best practices, try to align them. And scale them across the state. We need to scale and map because these opportunities exist in every corner of Connecticut, in every nook of Connecticut, and we need to make sure every individual has the opportunity to say something like make a space from all the things you work, et cetera, and for a team. So I look forward to hearing about Kennel, what they're doing in STEM, what they're doing with youth to continue to grow the opportunities that they get. We're having a great time here in the state of Connecticut because we work with you and your team and others like you are doing in Connecticut. And that's great. We're going to create even more opportunities for our individuals. So, thanks for having me this morning. Congratulations again.
pursue professional counseling. He's a partner of our resident. And Joel's going to do a bang up job because he asks a lot of questions and he has some really impressive truths about life. Next, we're going to do a little cheesy talk to take a seat. Will is the former chair, or excuse me, Will is the technology education coach in Harvard Public Schools. Will Cheney is an instructional coach in the Harvard School STEM department, working on for teachers and students K 12 to promote authentic and engaging technology and education. Recently, his major focus has been on applied technology, bringing physical computing, 3D printing, and computer aided manufacturing to Harvard students to address the workforce gap and having a skilled trade. Uh, she is the director of Student 5.0 for Ready CT. Nyla joined Ready CT to support the education to workforce pipeline and positively affect the state's economy. Her priority is to make students learn about them, more about them and help them to prepare for futures they want through engagement with range of learning opportunities. Nyla is a Connecticut native and a product of the New Haven school system. While in New Haven, she participated in various programs, including LEAP, Talented, Gifted City Kids, the Dwight Edgewood Product, Educational Center for the Arts, and Howard Hart Heights, all of which helped to inform her leadership style. While attending Quinnipiac, Nyla developed her passion for education and started a student organization to connect the resources at her college to the greater community in Connecticut. She was largely motivated by education prison merry around and recognized how education could be used as a tool to create better outcomes. Her teaching experience includes working as an elementary school teacher as part of the Teach for America program while earning her master's degree in education, leadership, scholarships, policy, and advocacy. She led a research program connecting students with high level vocabulary in elementary schools and across New York City. And we welcome Next, I'd like to invite up Matt Flurry. Most people recognize Matt as the president and chief executive officer of the Connecticut Science Center. Matt's held the Connecticut Science Center, held the position of the Connecticut Science Center the opening day through its growth as a top educational destination and attraction for not only the city of Hartford, but for the state. As president and CEO, he's advanced an ambitious educational agenda in service to children, families, schools, educators, and employers, and led an exceptionally high performing organization to inspire millions of people. Matt previously served as an economic development role for the state of Connecticut. He has also enjoyed careers in the telecommunications industry and <laughs> Matt earns his Master's of Business Administration from the University of Connecticut School of Business, his undergraduate degree at Charter Oak State College, and an associate's degree at Harvard Community College. He received his honorary doctorate of humane letters from Southern Connecticut State University. Matt was appointed by successive governors to serve as the chair of Connecticut's Board of Regents for Higher Education. And he served as a member of the Association of Science and Technology Centers for the Board of Directors. Currently, he is a member of the Metro Hartford Alliance Board of Directors and the Jacob Hidden Fund Committee for the Middlesex Foundation. He was born in Manhattan and he has been reside in West Hartford. We're double dipping with him because he's also the parent of one of our summer STEM students. So Matt holds a lot of different perspectives from a lot of different degrees. And next, I'd like to invite up. Anike Director of Workforce Solutions Collaborative with Metro Harvard. Anike is an economist and educator dedicated to helping people and organizations reach success. Anike's role in careers include management, consulting with an international firm, and theater executive roles in global organizations. He specializes in workforce development during the past five years. He teaches the business seminar at Yale University summer session. The vaccine appointed the position he's held for the past 20 years. In addition, Enrique has volunteered with town government commissions and served on nonprofit boards, including refugee resettlement programs, the Community Foundation for New Britain, and the Family Repair Haven Community Health Center. 
He's recently become a member of Social Impact Partners. Enrique received his graduate degree in economics from Yale University. He and his wife live in Guilford, where they have the joy of raising their three children. Last but not least, thank you for joining us. Damien is an aerospace systems engineer at Pratt & Whitney uh, with a background in electrification and aerospace industries. He is an experienced technical support lead and holds a master's degree in technology and management from Central Connecticut State University. Damien is also a parent of ours with his son participating in the summer STEM program at Maine State in 2023. All of you, and you're very busy with this to join us today. So. That was a mouthful. Thank you, Deborah. I know I didn't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for doing that. I appreciate it. Um, we have a beautiful speaker. But I want to talk about the people from the home perspective, especially in um, your work with employers, um, to really share that perspective. Um, so, welcome today to our uh, wonderful uh, discussion on the United Taxes, the United I'm really excited to be here. Today, we, um, as Chris says, we have a number of folks from various industries, and we really want to um, explore the factors that inspire students. Learn how to um, help parents be more involved in their education. Um, we learn about educator support, how learning can actually be uh, help with learning and impact students. Also, looking for other networks. Uh, a number of people I have mentioned today in this work and how to get along and how to identify them. So, the power of collaboration is what's really good in order for this uh, to move forward. Um, also, looking for how to help coordinate the Opportunities to successfully impact the working interests of young people from diverse backgrounds. Um, and so I know we have a number of employers here. You are 100% needed as a part of this uh, solution. Um, we were talking about transportation uh, as a huge barrier and how a lot of these uh, opportunities for STEM and manufacturing opportunities are not in the core area. So um, this is an all of our uh, initiatives for all of us here. It will be all of us really solve some of these issues. Um, and then also for employers, the biggest message for me is to say that um, we got to really think about um, how we hire the sense of the to work and work in ways not for the people. You can't do it the way that you've done it without work. So we've got all to change our mindset. So with that being said, I'm going to start off uh, uh, really kind of uh, talking to our um, so the very first question I'm going to um, ask everyone just to give a bit more opportunity because we have a large panel and then the first question. Um, so the first question is what ignites passion for technology? Good morning. Um, Honestly, I think that it's really creating awareness around technology. Um, I think sometimes we make all of the words, the words are very but show students what we mean by technology, what it feels like to be in technology, and all of those things students can really do. They have a real inner space, they know what they have to cross their hands, um, and sitting in a classroom, which is something that they're not so much interested in. So getting them out into those spaces, what it's like to be in those spaces, and that's just a common thing. I was thinking about this question, obviously, in preparation, and then Chris put it perfectly um, in a way to kind of capture what I was going to say, which is the idea of the taste of success. Um, I think for students to see that, something, stick with a problem, and solve, uh, come up with a solution that maybe they thought was outside of their grasp, or was something, you know, other people do. Um, whether it's a programming solution, or engineering design, or, uh, you know, getting a 3D printer to produce your part, uh, that little taste of success starts to uh, create momentum, to 
do keep trying more and more challenges. So that's what I've seen as we brought these programs, not only to our high schools, but really to try to get that space of success and STEM happening all the way down to the very level. It's great um, You know, our work at the Connecticut Science Center is focused on the whole idea that relevance is critical. Um, and a recognition that 95% of the work is that we find So as deeply as we care, individually, as educators, as a science center, about the work in the classroom, we have to also recognize that so many of the influences that might cause us to embrace what's happening in the classroom or would form our thoughts careers happening outside of that experience. So in what we refer to as informal science education at the Science Center and the panoply of informal learning opportunities in which major space I think could be considered one of the finest um, it is the recognition that it's about the relevance of the tactile experience, that moment of success that I did that, that I made something, and then helping to draw the connections between those experiences and the possibilities that they represent throughout life, academically, in studies, whether it's science class or pursuing a career here at Capital Community College or in one of the employment uh, organizations here you know, across the state. Can I really quickly talk a little from the parent perspective on that idea over here uh, uh, Happy to, to, to do that. I have two boys, uh, they're about to turn 15, and um, Bobby has been at a couple of programs, including Julie's, Cole's, uh, drones, 3D printing, and they made uh, Raspberry Pi computers. Like, they made the computer, bring some of this computer. <laughs> it's amazing. And, you know, it's a great example. So what Makerspace did, which was magnificent, was not only engaged in wonderful education opportunities they have here in the educators um, who, who provide them a uh, great experience about how's this drone work, how can it be used, what can you do to manipulate the device, etc. Then they gave it to them and said, take it home and experiment. So actually the drone fell out of the tree after a long cold winter the other day and it still works. <laughs> So the inspiration is continued. So, uh, excuse me. The, um, the notion that uh, in modern, in modern um, I would say, education and how we uh, grow up ends up with uh, most people reaching adulthood, uh, losing and abandoning any sense of curiosity. So uh, we have to foster that curiosity in our children so that they can <clears throat> maintain that passion. Um, <clears throat> and then the other thought I have about this issue of uh, exciting and inspiring children is the idea that technology and STEM can uh, be brought to them and make a personal connection to the possibilities to each person individually. That it's not magic. It looks like magic when you see a drone, but it's not magic. And we have to go in deeper with each one of our children. So I'm up here to last. I take a lot of it. But um, what I think is to inspire the students. It's a combination of how does it work and how do they work. We have to find that synergy between the two and meet the students where they are. We make a space, it's an opportunity to expose students with diverse backgrounds, maybe from underprivileged situations. So if we find out where they are, where they come from, what makes them tick, then we can actually find them. How we can bridge that gap, and then additionally, that encourage. The biggest thing that the biggest way to success is by encouraging the students, letting them know what they can do, what they should do, because that encourages. So, the themes that I'm picking up are creating awareness, uh, 
relevance is critical. Um, learning to not only have in the classroom, um, and that uh, what makes me go back thinking about it is parents. And what we're talking about young folks who are before or who never experienced the manufacturing opportunities, how do we get their parents to be involved um, so that they're also educated? And it's such a really great push for all of you for having us. Maker space and action to definitely take advantage of the tour after our um, conversation today. So you can really see for yourself like, what excites me when I first came here to physically see the work. It's just super exciting. So uh, thank you. And I know that it's been really we were all rushed into this, uh, having to use technology. And for some of us, we learn and I'm learning and I'm learning how to use technology. Um, we will all have a variety of ways with that. Um, so thank you. Um, our next question, um, I'm going to start uh, with you, uh, Will. Um, thinking about what happens exists to prepare for systemic education and all for students in the I think that this question of what happens exists is really important. Um, not only because it's about Sorry, me and my teacher, but if it is, I apologize. I'm trying to adjust. Um, there, there, are, there are so many roads in, but as a parent, actually, I, I'm reflected on the, the reality. We got a, a conversation Deborah and I had actually, we're standing out all the wonderful summer camp programs. About the fact that these were incredible opportunities, but we had to get the audience to get used to them. And the Connecticut Science Center was not offering that kind of program, but we were lighting the bulb on the thousands of kids' minds that if given the opportunity, could be carried out their next step in their STEM journey. And even as a parent in the head of the Connecticut Science Center, if I had not known them, or other people in the sort of you know standard community here, I would have been challenged to find what's that next obvious step. Um, and I think that this is where we have to be. I know you have questions about ecosystem and how to work together. There are, and I think there remains to be seen whether we had a dearth of opportunities to explore STEM throughout the steps of our journey from early age all the way to career. Um, I guess that there needs to be more. more. Um, um, but there also are a great many CC great many opportunities that are under the hood or that the right people right don't know about. And when I say the right people, right I mean often the people you don't know about because, because their parents are on the forefront of, hey, I know it can't straight and lift me off for my kid. It's a child who could just as well benefit from that, but doesn't know what's there. So what we started to think about is as you know, if we have an attribute that is unique, I like to think. One is the scope and scale of the nearly 5 million people who searched since we opened in 2009 and the hundreds of thousands of people. We get that one. So, what I think we have to do a lot of the space and others is the potential we have to take that moment and even if it's not with us, to find success as continuing that individual's journey throughout the ecosystem. And if that means the Connecticut Science Center handed off a customer, so to speak, that's, that's less important than the fact that that person needs to be their journey. And if we as all as providers think that way, and utilize the various attributes we have and strengths we have, we can make better use, and most importantly, of our communities, parents and kids, make better use of the ecosystem and resources. Thank you for that. So, on this panel, we We've got employers, uh, folks that represent employers and employee partnerships. It's been really great to hear from our folks who and their expertise on this very same question. What happens exist to further the system education um, and over the manufacturing? I want to take that maybe, maybe back backwards a little bit um, okay. and, and talk about the avenues to get students started with uh, education and then. So we can talk about the roles that the community has to further pursue that. Um, um, but at Hartford Public Schools, since I came on, 
I'm not saying we're hand clear or anything, but I came on as part of a, a new department, a small, small department uh, in STEM. And our, and our mission was really to bring these courses out of the realm of an elective or a club. Some is my favorite. As part of the core literacy in our know, rates. Um, and the Connecticut's CS plan legislation is required computer science education in every you know, school at every grade level that's helped to advocate for that status that that uh, computer science and STEM education is not something that's just important. Um, and that uh, matter of literacy then our students to make informed decisions about the other and we want to do. Um, we, we grew kindergarten to eighth grade, we call it curriculum ready to rise. And there's four really conference and their technology literacy program design thinking. So that when students get to ninth grade and take our technology class, they can make an informed decision about maybe what schools they want to attend, whether it's technical tools outside of the district or our different families or conferences that offer. Different pathways from uh, computer science, supply technology, and manufacturing, uh, IT, and network, um, and then to, you know, to be able to make an important decision about that. Uh, growing, growing up, up high school offered great STEM programming, and I uh, was, was part of the generation of the series generation where I've been using a lot but then just use graphics. I was more of an arts and humanities student. Uh, I, was a, I was a history teacher out of college. I went to uh, you, you teach. In fact, I have my uh, teacher operation program at the University of Texas. There's you teach liberal arts, and there's you teach capital science. And they're entirely the same. And I think that uh, can be problematic, and I think that's something that's starting to be or, or to be uh, more uh, in the ecosystem on different subjects so that students can make those decisions and see how they put their skills fit together. Um, at the point, at the high school point where we have these manufacturing opportunities, then it becomes uh, it's sort of where we are right now. Uh, our project is to connect the opportunities outside the school. They have that you now they can go pursue their passion with that basic knowledge. Another really often brings the key perspective on how globalization is working and we also kind of the future that we have to do this Yes, so I think for me this question goes to the ecosystems mm -hmm. um, and how our knowledge is going to limit to the partners that we work with. And so what I would like to see is a community where we have the truth and understanding what there is out there. If I think about the partnerships that we work with, it's going to be specific to uh, our living on the time. We work with families to get kids connected to that um, field where they can put their hands on something that we have to do last year. It's just a little bit. We pay for them to come and get the most class. Uh, those are just individual students and those are individual programs. I think that if we raise a forty dollars we don't have to worry about not having an opportunity um, because that opportunity exists somewhere. Uh, and also, it's 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 a shop in in Middletown. Um, and and so, as a connector of the education partners, the training providers, if we're able to make that connection with someone, it's hard to give it to them. Um, so, we're currently working on a lot of schools, two to five, six different school districts with all different schools. And so, we are the connector between the training providers like major states or we're school. We are also the connector to the employer. So, we have students um, who are maybe in Manchester, we're going to take those students to the Next week. And so being that connector um, is really, really important, but also understanding what is really available. And a lot of times, our kids are and these wires are sometimes too late. Students like really have a parent who studied that we started in January, 
And so I had to do something and then put it all over my own. So really understanding what is on the horizon, what is the timeline, what is the enrollment process, and having that information to approve all of us make sure that those CTAs get it. Um, and being able to develop those partnerships where people are holding seats because we have all the student access. So I think just thinking about how we work together on the adult level, on the community level, and then be able to provide information to peer students. Thank you very much. It would be great to hear from you, put your respect on you, that you are an employer panel, it's not partnerships, especially in that fashion. What are employers saying in terms of how they, what's the first thing that you need to do that? Yeah, thank you. I uh, will sponsor an American Advanced Manufacturing and Career Partnership. Uh, and it is a notion of more employers becoming engaged to offer, for example, the summer internships. We do have more students uh, applying for work. Programs that we have goals for them and the different programs. And so, as Chris very uh, relevantly pointed out a few minutes ago, is that we have already put the red things that we can scale, but we need to now industrialize the things that work on our strategy and that are needed. Because we never know, there are children that people don't know that some app is available to them. And in fact, we need, we need to really offer that opportunity to all of them. And so, it's exciting to the point where they don't think that this is the workforce shortage of the, the struggle to. And so this was going to be a question that we were going to ask, but we'd love to hear from you a few questions from an employer perspective. And you're uh, working for Crown Boy, who has been doing a lot of wonderful work, track with the pipeline, really honoring a lot of folks in our communities and really high wages. What's important to your community? Employers need you. And and when we start looking at her, we're like, so it's been mentioned here already. Informing information is key to students and their parents, allowing them that opportunity. To see what's on the horizon in the reading of all times, so that they're able to now say, okay, I can start planning how we do I can start planning how we live the world. STEM is important as we know. That's the problem. I mean, for instance, that's the kind of thing. He did six goals to the right system. Technology. Let's solve those tax systems that we know are children that we know not here for certain industries. But they are interested in most of the time in video games and the MA and things like that. So do you utilize both interests? Thank you. 
I'm going to put this song, which goes back to the question. If I'm looking to try to figure out what is that summer opportunity for my kid instead, I know there are other parents that are giving me hard time because they don't know if they're all better statistics for me or them. So we have to help them find it. That's all I'm saying. Thank you. Uh, we'd like to hear from you. Uh, your work is parents and if you are a parent yourself, um, what, what would you tell parents that they're working with uh, that they can also be working with that they're working with? So I'm thinking about a few different things. One is, if students are excited, they're going to go home and tell their siblings and their parents and everything else. So part of it is building that relationship with the person where they're talking about them and they're encouraging the things that they're doing in school at home. Um, parents also love opportunities for their kids, so bringing them opportunities that we're ask them, that they're going to ask for all those opportunities. If students aren't excited about something, they're not going to share the flyers they have to know that. So it's a matter of getting the young people excited and then building the relationships with the parents as well, letting them know what they need for them. When I was an elementary school teacher, I had more relationships with parents in high school a lot of the times. Kids are older, there's a lot of teachers, and so when I call a kid, there's a prize in there, but one of them is not something that's negative. We can show that we build the relationships with parents, and they say, if we offer this, and we can offer this, um, through our funding, we're able to purchase uh, workbooks for students. We're able to put a dry ice bed. And so parents are coming up like, I don't want this book clutter. How do I get access to this thing? And so if we're telling parents that we can offer those things, and we show that we're here, and also that we are following the things that we say we're going to do, then the parents are going to be champions with us. Um, we have parents that we work with two years ago who are still following us and excited about the progress that we are following our baby. So I think we need to be sure that we're communicating. Um, I've been an analyst with really, really well about uh, the connection that like, writing some teammates with parents and we are still just are dated and connecting to a point that students are excited about something that you're getting on and talk about it. That's huge. And I think that happens when they achieve something. Um, and so achievement is close to that. And really, like, cheering for those kids when they when they talk about something. Programming in third grade and making a flat bird go up and up. Go home, show this to your parents, play this to your sister, whatever. My own kids are very young, I have a five year old and a four year old. And so their sort of career exploration uh, isn't quite uh, taking hold yet. But um, they, uh, my son in particular, who's five, is like he can't be very focused on. Something he wants to accomplish. Uh, and kind of go to that 3D printer in the house, having someone who's learning about programming stuff. Just about anything you can think of. Like, I wonder how to do it, but I can say, you can figure out how to do that. We can all of that. This is silly, but I can take a look at my kids and watch Daniel Tiger. And uh, there's a recurring song on the show, like something you need to try and make it yourself. Is that all the time at home? Uh, I have to say, I think it's in the schools. Like, uh, you, these are attainable students. Um, and if you, you do something that felt like, like it was outside of the possibility, um, that's really exciting. And that's what I'm going to talk about with parents. Uh, the other important point uh, is I think there's a lingering misconception about the trades you Industry and what kind of opportunity that comes to provide for our And so we're working hard to have some excellent like, high school manufacturing teachers who aren't just teaching machine skills. Uh, really, that probably 60% of their focus is on professionalism and work ready skills. Uh, Hartford High School just completely renovated their shop and it looks like a high end 
up to date and manufacturing the shop. Class one the same work over And they're also installing workplace cubicle style tasks for their students. That, that, those two jobs are a workplace environment. Students clock in and they, they work more on time, they stay in front of the I think that side of things needs to be promoted as well. To convey to our students and to, to, to their parents that these are alternative options, these are professional career options that we're preparing. So, I'm back to the seventh grade industrial arts and drafting classroom and also working with ceramics and clay and, and then doing uh, electrical work and salary things and things that I never had ever had access to. And of course, things are not as available as the science here that I have. I do want to turn to a bit um, and talk about um, the idea of creating the wider networks within our uh, yes, um, so there are a number of people in our region who often are working in I can tell you how many times I go to some paper meetings and I realize that some two providers or agencies the professional have never heard of before. And so uh, increasingly I find that my value ladder uh, is to be a connector to break them the cycle. Over together uh, in pursuing common goals. Um, I want to issue sort of a, a warning related to this, which is that I visited many factories in Europe and other parts of the world. And when you go to any factory in Germany, the machines are the exact same machines we use here. You know, so I don't want to go Catchy, you know, CNC charter. <clears throat> but what makes the difference, and the government said this very eloquently a couple of days ago at the city of the what the Finnish does as a country and as a state is the power of our people, our labor um, expertise, and qualified and productive labor force. And so this is this is the power of connecting and working and transferring innovation especially. So it's in addition to learning the skills for our people to be able to uh, fit into these uh, new jobs. It's to foster in them creativity to see things they're doing the actual work at the machine and find a way to shape, say, five seconds from transferring material from one place to another. So that's money, right? And that's what we have to do with the very best to foster is the power of our human capital. Thank you so much for being here for the entire day. I mean, it's an amazing conversation. I want to thank the panelists for really taking us up on this challenge. Um, we will be here uh, for the rest of the program. Um, I also thank you to Major Space and the Indian Board that you all are doing um, everything that you do to surround these people here today, which is really good to see. Um, just to get out a little bit of digital systems uh, and collaboration really takes trust. Um, it takes vulnerability. Um, and today the employers that we keep in and the partners of life as a media part of this process. So I invite you all to learn the topics of the media today. Um, to really encourage other people and yourself to continue this conversation with you forward. So thank you very much and have a great day.
and it seemed to shock him all. It was incredible. And it's not just Deborah, although she's been our fearless leader, and we owe everything to her, but this team makes it all possible. If you talk to any old pilots, get craft pilots, there's a term called dead reckoning. And dead reckoning is when you've lost power to the cockpit. And none of your GPS or navigation or guidance systems are working properly. You have to trust your gut. You have to steer through the tur turbulence, and you have to guide your aircraft back on track safely. Eric, I'd like you to come up here, please. So, dead reckoning is a little bit about, a little bit like the journey we've been on here. Um, we're on, we're on this journey. We've made it through five years, it's incredible. It feels like seven or eight because we've just been two years old here. But we've had our doors open to our meeting. Let's not forget, as well as our youth. We're doing something very, really special here in the city. And um, I'm so proud of this world with you. So like the pilot said, I reckon that we raise our glasses and celebrate the next five years with our growing family, our contributors, our sponsors, our supporters, and mostly our friends. Thank you for being here with us. Here's the five more years, and Julie's cake right over there. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone, thank you for being here. Take some food if you can. Let's all